Ephesians chapter 5. Remember last week we talked, to, talked about the coming of the Lord. He is, turn it down just a, just a hair, Glenn. It's ringing a little bit. Um, last week we talked about the coming of the Lord, the things associated with that. And Paul is, is, is I guess, sharing with the Thessalonica people. Uh, Thessalonians up there and telling him, you know, the things that, you know, I guess that, that's going to be coming, you know, in, in the end times and all. And giving them, I guess, uh, some some help, some things uh, to look forward to. Only problem he gave them as he's doing all these things is that many of them, we'll see one of the problems here as we get down to verse 15, 16. Uh, one of the things they believe from that point when he told them that the Lord is coming back, you know, type deal, they believed that he was coming back in their lifetime. You know, and uh, before they died, uh, remember we talked about before and had a lot of problems because some of their loved ones were dying, and the Lord didn't come back yet, so he's worried about that. And he was explaining all the things about that, which was covered in Daniel, you know, and all this kind of stuff. He did that, but uh, it caused a problem with them because many of them thought that that basically that the Lord was coming back, so they just quit. They quit working. They quit doing. They quit doing anything else. Hey, we're just going to sit here and have a good time and enjoy ourselves because the Lord is coming back soon anyway. And that has been a long time ago, okay? And we're still looking for that same thing that they were looking for, the Lord to come back, okay? And we know that the Lord is coming back. You know, that's the assurance we have. The Lord is coming back, and he will take us as Christians out of here before the great tribulation times, and that's, uh, you know, that, our uh, promise from God, and we, we rest on that assurance. Beginning in verse 12, verse 12 in the First Thessalonians chapter 5, in verse 12, talks about basically the, ch the church life. Reminds us their responsibility as believers in the congregation that they're, they're worshiped within. It says, Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Basically, he is uh, talking about there. We don't know much about the setup of the church back at the time when Paul set these things up. Uh, their belief is, and by studies and everything else, they, they dealt with probably on a deal of church and elders and, you know, had somebody that, that preached to them and did the open scriptures to them and all this kind of stuff. But many of the church movement, church work and everything else was done through a group of elders. But they were, the people were having a problem with these elders or the people that lead the church. And he is telling them, hey, they are admonishing you because that's what God leads them to do. That's their job. So you respect them and lift them up and lift them up in their, their work because that's... Uh, that's a very hard job to you know to lead a church and to you know lead a bunch of Christians, lead a bunch of people to any anything, okay, whether Christians or not, but even a bunch of Christians, you know, type deal. And he said, you know, to lift them up and make sure that they they are doing God's will. The people are doing God's will, but they need your help, their help in prayer and to lift them up so that they can continue to do what God wants them to do in the thing. So, you know, back then it was said that there, no church was ruled by, by a single person. There's no one room church. And that's the problem we get sometimes today in our churches and everything else. We see a bunch of these, I guess, offshoots that come out. And we got one first, Jim Jones and all you name it, a bunch of them, that has one leader and they form a church. And therefore, that's when all heck breaks loose. Okay? Because it gets off the beaten path. It gets off of God's plan. Uh, you know, like I say, and I always say that, uh, you know, thank goodness that, you know, we have pastors and, and, and all that, you know, lead us in, in worship and lead us in, you know, to the glory of God. You know, that type of deal. And we have people that's also working behind him and with him and this type of deal to lead the church to, you know, make the steps they need to do. And that's what Paul is telling the church today. So nothing's changed between the time Paul is talking to the Thessalonian people and today's. It's exactly the same thing. So we, we should, you know, uphold our leaders, uphold those people that are, that are doing the work in the church. Verse 13 says, Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with, the, with each other. He is telling them... The biggest problem we as Christians have is to get along with one another. You know, it's a, that's just the world today. You know, it's hard to get along with a lot of people, you know, type deal. But God is telling them, you know, that is our job as Christians, to do whatever we need to do to love one another to the point of actually getting along with them. Many times, and you'll see if you just get a little further along, you know, there's no such thing as retaliation as a Christian. There's no such thing as getting even. You know, so many times when we're we're wrong, whatever, ever however you're wrong, there's many ways that sometimes perceived and unperceived wrong that somebody does to you, and one of the first things you want to do is get even, get back with them, because it makes you feel good. Well, I really hammered them today, you know, and we as Christians, you say that, and sometimes I've, I've done that in my life, 
You say, you know, well, I got evil in the middle of the day. And it's amazing when you go into your prayer time, one of the first things you have to do is ask God to forgive you for that. Because you feel pretty bad. You're as bad as they are. You're even worse because you know Christ and you know God and you know what God has for your life and that's forgive each other and love one another as you love yourself. So therefore, you know, he is telling them that, you know, you want to do that, you know, basically to, to get along, to do, do what God wants you to do and do it the way that God wants you to do. You know, not only do you forgive them, you love them through it. Well, that's, that's even harder. It's one thing to, you know, not get even with them or not get mad with them or whatever that's, this type of thing is, but to love them and show good things for them. I know all of us have heard the same thing. It, you know, basically the best thing to do if somebody if somebody has done you wrong is to be nice to them. It heaps, even scripture says heaps coals on their lives. And I'm sitting there going, I don't want coals. I want something hot. Okay, <laughs> you know, that type of deal. But anyway, but you know, you know, God knows us and God wants us and God wants us to live like Christ would live. If we judge our actions each and every day, each and every situation we're under. If we judge our acts of what would Christ do in this situation, we'll know what our answer is. And so many times it'll be different than what we want to do. Okay? Because we have that sinful nature, that sin nature in our lives, and Satan is alive and well in you and me. And he will continue to be alive and well until we draw our last breath or until we rapture it out of here, whichever comes first. And then all that sin nature will be gone. We'll be in perfect bodies and perfect in, in tune with God. So he wants us to get along each and every day as verse 13 talks about. Verse 14 says, We urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle. Encourage the timid. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Basically, he's saying here to warn the unruly. Those, those things he's talking about here, the unruly that he is speaking here, here is those that are doing nothing. Those are sitting around. Those are not doing God's work. Only reason you and I are here on this earth is to do God's will and God's work for him. When he is through with you and I, I truly believe, and I think Scripture sees that he has truly believed, he'll take us home. We're done. I'm done with you, Mark. So there's nothing else for me to do, nobody else for me to witness to, nobody else for me to, to tell them about Christ in my life. You know, the Lord's going to reward me and say, come on, it's time for you to go home and live with me. But until that point in time, we're to continue to work, continue to do, okay? And the problem is here that these people were idle. They were sitting around. Idle is, you know, always heard in my life, you know, idle is the devil's workshop. Idle makes indecision, makes, makes problems with problems, makes, makes uh, you know, people just not, not be able to get along, you know, that type of deal. He said, so he is telling them to continue to work each and every day in their jobs and they're making a living, okay, and the things they need to do for sustain themselves physically, but also in their spiritual lives and, you know, growing God each and every day. It says, encourage the timid. Exhort those who have a problem. Exhort those, those that are not as outgoing. So many times he is talking to, you know, strong Christians. He says, you know, we need to reach over and take them and lift them up. Because we as strong Christians don't have any problem with doing our work and the things we do, you know, for God and everything else. Because that's who we are. And that's what God, you know, has led us to be. But we're to also help those, those people that are not as strong as we are. Those people that will sit back. Many of them will not raise their hand, will not, you know, make a, make a comment, will not do whatever. But we need to entice them to grow in God and understand that they're accepted even with that. It says, uphold the meek, the meek in spiritually, physically, morally, whatever it may be. We're to encourage those. We're to pray for those. We're to help those in a time of, time of troubles in their life. As we do in this class, when we get up, you know, prayer request, you know, we, we're quick to pray for those people to lift them up in God's presence because they have a need that they can't meet. They have a need, need that you and I can't meet, but you and I can be instrumental in them to lift them up in the presence of God and ask God to meet their needs, okay, which he will do. He will uphold those. He says, be patient with all, be long-suffering. <laughs> we're sometimes very short-suffering. You know, but that's just the way the world teaches us today. That is what the world's all about. Me, myself, and I is what we're taught. That's what, that's what they tell our kids. That's what we, we teach our kids so many times. You know, what is good for me is good for everybody. Hogwash. What's good for God 
is good for everybody. It's not necessarily what may be good for you or what you, you like or what you want, don't like or whatever else, but that's what, that's what God has for us, okay? Verse 15 says, Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always be, try to be kind to each other and to, to everybody else. He is saying that we're, it's easy for us to be kind and be, be I guess, uh, gentle and everything else with those people that agree with those people we like. But Paul is telling them we're to be kind with everybody. Those people that we don't like. Those people that do not see us and, as, as being like them. Or we can't see them as being like us. You know, it does not say, God is not telling through Paul here to take people and accept them where they are. We accept them as an individual. We, we love the sinner. We hate the sin. So therefore, if you're around someone that's sinning, you do not accept them in that sin role. You make sure you admonish them that, hey, God has a better way. God paid the price for the sin in your life. You know, give them those things to bring them up, you know, to make do that. And we'll see here in a minute in the next verse where it talks about of shun, from shun yourself from evil. You know, it does not mean we're being good friends of those, those evil people, those people that are living a sinful life. We admonish them. We love them because of who they are and whose they are, Okay. But we also do not put ourselves on a continual basis in fellowship with them. I always tell my grandkids, I always tell my grandkids who was growing up and all, do not, you choose your friends wisely. Your friends are who you are. And you will not raise a, a, a bad person up to where you are. That bad person is going to take you down to where they are. That's just the way it happens. You know, I had uh, Bryson, you know, many times said, well, I got this friend, he's having a real hard problem, so I'm trying to befriend him. And I said, you, you befriend him by telling him what God has for him. Tell him that there's a better way. What he's doing is wrong. But you do not be friendly with him to the point of being bosom buddies because it would, does not work that way. Okay? And it's real hard for young people to understand that. We as older people have done that before, and we've been around, been around the thing two or three times. So we understand how that works, how you're brought down by those that are in sinful ways. How it's just one time, well, we'll go to a party with you. You know, I tell my, I'm real proud of my grandsons, and y'all know that, and my, well, my granddaughters too, but my grandsons and all, you know, said you know, it's amazing how that they never get invited to these weekend parties. And I told them, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord that you don't. Because what's happening at those weekend parties? I said, you know, what's happened to those weekend parties is things that you do not need to be associated with. And you are living against that so they don't bother to ask you. Uh, he had one guy, came, one, one of his friends, you know, came to him and said, oh, Bryson, how about you want to go to a party? Oh, no, he's right. You don't go to this. And I said, what a testimony that is. What a, that's, that's a testimony in life that they refuse to even ask you to go because they know, well, he don't go there and he don't do those things. So now then, that's a testimony and a witness for God that will make a difference somewhere along the line. It may not be anything you ever see, but somewhere along the line, they'll look back on it and say, I once knew this guy. I once knew this girl that lived for the Lord in every way and best they could, even though they stumbled sometimes, but they, they did the very best they could. So witness for God wherever you are. Verse 16 says, Be joyful always. We've talked about this so many times. Where did your joy come from? Your joy comes from right here, where you live, where God is. Joy comes from the Lord himself. Happiness comes from circumstances. We being joyful and living for God and being having the joy of God in us, happiness in our lives is much different than the lost world. Much different. Because we know where we're going. We know what's happening. We know the price that God paid for us. But he said, you know, be joyful always. You know, that's real hard to do. It's real easy to say, but it's real hard to do. Because when we're down the dumps and we get a bad report, a medical report, or we lose a loved one or whatever else, it's real hard to be joyful. God understands that. You know, I, I've talked to some people and I said, well, I, you know, I must not be living the right life that God wants me to be because I've lost a loved one and I'm, and I'm mad. And I'm upset. And I said, God understands that. God looks on that and he's going to lift you out of it. 
And he's the way that you're going to get out of this mess that you're in. Because those that lost people don't have anybody to try to lift them up. So they just wallow in that sorrow. They wallow in that pity for themselves. Okay? But God says, you know, I'm the joy of your life. I live in your heart and I'm the joy of your life. Relish that joy that God gives each and every one of us. Verse 17 says, pray continually. This does not mean, Paul is not telling them to hear. When you get up in the morning, get down on your knees and pray all day long till nighttime, go back to bed, get up the next morning and pray, get on your knees, pray all day long, okay? But Paul is telling them to be, live in a prayerful nature throughout their lives. You should always have a prayer time, an individual, personal prayer time with God. Be it morning, noon, night, whatever else. Set you a time. And I, I just really, you know, admonish you to do that. Set you a time when you have a chance to lift up to God your supplications, your needs, your desires, your, jo your, your joy, your love, everything else. All those things for God. That special time that you set aside each and every day gives you a time not only to talk with God, but it also gives you a time to be, be heard by God. To God to speak to you. So many times we pray, and we pray right through our, our prayer, and we go, oh, amen, we're gone. We never let God speak to us. Some of the best prayers I've ever heard is, you know, is a one or two sentence prayer and then quiet. Just quiet. Let God speak to the people we're praying for. It's amazing when we devil have a silent prayer. When you after you give them someone will give you a silent prayer, that 30 seconds seems to last for hours. Seems to last for hours. But it's so, so neat to know as you do that so many times, you know, God will bring things to mind that will bring joy to your life. Okay? He also is talking about here having a special prayer time that we have each and every day. The other one is to be extreme. Ex ex mm, that's a big word. Talks about quickly, right now, when that things happen. Okay? Basically, you know, that's what our prayer list does. When we send out those prayer needs each and every day, y'all get them sometimes Sometimes it burns your phone up like it burns my phone up, you know, type deal. But as soon as you get that, you stop right then and have a quick prayer for whoever, whoever the need is. That's what God has put in your, in your deal to work for him, do his work. Because that person we're praying for needs his Christian friends to lead him, to lift him up, or lift her up, and be there for them in the place. If you've never experienced that, I just feel so sorry for you. I think every Christian in their lifetime has experienced that one times, many times. I know I've experienced it many times in my life. Where that you're to the point and you just kind of go, I, I, I've got wits in. I've got nothing else I can do. So you just turn it over to God and God will lift you up because of the prayers that people have for you. You know that all things are well. Even though the outcome may not be what you want, you know all things are well because everything works for the good of God. Everything is in your life, be it as we define bad or good, everything works for the good of God. God is taking care of you. God loves you. Okay? Uh, so pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, the good and the bad. We give thanks for everything. There's lessons to be learned in God. And, you know, many times, only time God gets my attention or gets your attention is when we've run out of anything we can do due to the problem. When we finally give up and say, okay, God, I cannot, I cannot solve this. I turn it over to you. It's amazing what that burden lifted off of you and God, what God dwells in your life and my life and shows his, his power and his strength to you. Whatever it may be, you know, live there. Live in God's power, not in your own, okay? Uh, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. In all things. Because God died, sent Jesus to die for you and me for all of our sins in our lives. To be that way that we can get out of this mess. We can actually overcome what Satan is doing here in this world. We look around us and Satan's alive and well. Satan is in control of so many things that, that affects our lives. So many people that affects our lives. You know, there's nothing you and I can do about that except pray to God that God would change them. That God will work in their lives. God will make a difference. And God will make a difference. Okay, for you and me. Verse 19. Do not put that, 
put out the, the Spirit's fire. We're real quick as Christians. I just say, I don't know why God puts up with us. You know, we get somebody on a mountaintop just been saved or whatever else, or they've had a great experience and then they're just bouncing off the walls. And what do we do? Go up to, well, you're on a mountaintop, but you come down to battle soon. Drag them off there. Yeah, you don't want them to be up there and you down here in this valley. So drag them down there where you are. Going, That's scriptural? Give me a break. You know, you're down in the valley. You should be up there. You can be up there too. You know, it says do not quench the spiritual fire. You know, spirit, spiritual fire, you can just see people that have spiritual fires alive and well. They're just radiating God's love. You know, we should be, say, no. What's he doing that I'm not doing? I want to get where he is instead of dragging him down here where I am. Okay? So build them up. Take those people that's down the valley with you and say, look, you and I can be up here. We have the capabilities. God loves us just like he does them. You and I can be there because of God's love for us. So let's get up there instead of dragging him back down here with us. Okay? But, you know, we have a great tendency to put out the fire. Quench the fire. Smooth it over. Make it back normal. Okay? That's not God's will in the life. It says, do not put out the spiritual fire. Verse 20 says, do not treat prophecies with contempt. Now, prophecies is in the old days. Basically, it's talking about prophecies was fulfilled and prophecy being the act of, of prophesying, being the act of a prophet, being a spiritual gift prophecy is no longer here in this world. Okay? No longer here as we define it in the, in the primary source. The primary thing of prophecy was to define and give the will of God in times to come. That's new things. New Testament filled all those prophecies. They did all those things. It tells you all the things that will happen. The Daniels, the revelations of John, and all those things. That This is complete. There's no other revelation that God's going to give anybody that's not in here already. If it wasn't, this wouldn't be complete. This would not be the inerrant, undefiled Word of God. So this is complete. Prophecy in its primary source is no longer alive and well because it is no, of no use because there's nothing else coming down from God. The secondary thing of prophecy is to prophesy, and that is interpreting and telling people what God's Word says. So we're prophesying to other people through God's Word, telling the truth of God's Word so they can apply it to their life. That is alive and, alive and well. Okay. So if you feel like, I, man, I'm, I, my gift of prophecy, your gift of prophecy is interpreting God's word in here of what God says, the truth that he has. You don't have anything new. There's nothing else new. Only one thing is going to save a sinner from death and, and hell and busting hell wide open, and that's the grace of God. Period in the sentence. Now, if you call that prophesying when I tell somebody that, you're prophesying. Okay? But you're prophesying by telling them what God's word says in the truths of God's word, okay? Nothing new, okay? Nothing outside of what God's already done for us, okay? Uh, and then it says, uh, verse 21, test everything, hold on to the good. Test everything. What he is talking about, Paul is talking to the people there, you test everything that you hear either a teacher say, or a preacher say, evangelist say, layperson say, when they're talking about the word of God, you should test everything you hear against what is right here. Okay? Test everything. You don't take it just because Charles Stanley said it. You don't say, take it because anybody else says it. You don't take it because Brother Mike said it. You sure don't take it because Marv said it. Okay? But you take it because what God said it. You test the things that you hear against the, the truths of the scriptures. If you hear something, I don't mean you sit out there and you know, do what I, you know, some of you may do it already. I'll just take notes on this. Man, he messed this up. He got this wrong. He got that. I'm not sure about this. You know, a lot of people will sit there and they'll, they'll say, well, I didn't like, I didn't agree with what he said today on whatever. Is that all you heard? Is that the reason you came? Did you come to get closer to God? Did you come to learn God's word? Or did you come to try to knock somebody down? If we did that, we're in the wrong place. Okay? And the best, worst thing we can do is we find somebody that said something. I say something wrong all the time. Y'all all know that. Y'all forgive me for that. Thank you, Lord. I appreciate that. 
I have a bunch of guys that, you know, to understand, you know, Marvin ain't smart as he thinks he is sometimes. You know, but, you know, many times what you say is not perceived of what you think you said. Many times that happens, okay? And when that happens, when you hear somebody tell you what God's Word says, and you say, I, I, I don't think that's right. I don't think that's what Scripture is talking about. Go back and research that and make sure that you're correct, that you are right, they were wrong. And what do we do with that? But one of the biggest things we do with that in our church is that we go out and tell everybody at Walmart, Brookshire's, and store, and everybody will get gas and everything else. Wrong. Worst thing in the world you do. If you see somebody, hear somebody say something you think is not scriptural, one of the first things you do is make sure that you're correct, make sure that we're wrong, test it against God's word, and then you go to them. You go to them and say, I'm not in a confrontational way. Go to them and say, I don't, want, I don't understand what you said about this subject or what you said about these things. And let them explain to you what they were saying, and then you explain to them back. You may not agree. You may agree to disagree that, you know, whatever's right, but whatever God's word is. But that's where you come back to. You don't go out and tell, put it on social media. I, I don't do social media, as, as y'all know, as far as uh, Facebook and whatever all that other junk is, and Twitter and Twitter and PNB and whatever all those other words are. I have no idea. No idea. I don't care to know. Okay? Because I don't want to know what you had for breakfast this morning. Okay? I go, and you sure don't know what I had for breakfast this morning because Miss Carol's out of town. So I guarantee you don't know what I don't want to know what I had. You know, that type of deal. But, you know, make sure as we test things that we have the right attitudes when we're testing things. We're testing to make sure that God is speaking through that person that we're listening to. Make sure that God is opening up the scriptures to people around us, including ourselves. Okay? And we test those things and we hold on to those things that are good. Hold on to the good things. Hold on to what God's promises are for our lives. God has so many promises. I, one time I went back and did a, did, did a study kind of on the promise of God through the, through the book. You don't have time to teach it. There's too many promises in here that God gives you and me every day throughout these scriptures. That's what we're to hold on to. Hold on to the good. Hold on to what God is doing for us in our lives. And then verse 22 says, avoid every kind of evil. In this world, it's kind of hard to avoid every kind of evil. What is Paul trying to tell us here? It is not to avoid that. No, if you did that, you'd have to live in a cocoon. You'd have to stay in your room by yourself, and then you'd still be in the presence of evil. Why? Because you have sin nature in your heart. So you have flunked already. Okay? So he is not saying that. What he's saying is you avoid, avoid those situations where evil is involved, where you know, you know that you shouldn't be. I tell young people as I, I meet and talk to them, get talk to them through, you know, through knowledge with my kids and grandkids and this type of deal, you know, you never test God. You don't say, well, I, that, I, I'll take a little dope. Yeah. I'll, I'll smoke a little dope. I'll smoke a little weed or, you know, take a pill or whatever else that idea. Because I'm strong in that so I won't get hooked on it so I don't have to have a problem with that. Idiot. I take a little drink of hard liquor. No problem. I'm not an alcoholic so I don't have a problem with that. One, you don't know what you do or not until you take it. And when you take it, it's too late to find out you, you are addicted to it now. So don't go there to start with. Avoid that evilness of there. But I tell, tell kids, it's not how it affects you, it's how it affects everybody that you know. From your parents, to your friends, to your loved ones. Because when you let God down, you're letting them down too. Because you are extension of who they are. Their teaching is what tried to bring you up the best they could. Did they make mistakes? Absolutely. Absolutely. Everybody in here has kids. You made a mistake or two. I guarantee you. My kids like to point them out to me. Why did you do this for your grandkids? You're going to do it for me. I say, because I love them more. <laughs> they go, okay, whatever. You know. But anyway, that, you know, just avoid, you know, get stress on them. And Paul is stressing us, avoid the evil situations of the world the best you can. Deal with them by being in the presence of God. Deal with, deal, deal with them by in the presence of Christian people. So if they believe like you do, 
and they are blessings like you are. I'm late already, so we're going to finish up chapter 5 next week, and then we'll get into introducing chapter, the Second Thessalonians, and we'll do that next week, and we'll get into Second Thessalonians after that, whatever. Father, Father, we love you. Thank you, God, for giving us your word. Thank you, God, for giving us the truths that we can apply to our lives. Father, thank you for this group of people that join together on Sunday mornings. Let's bring us brothers and sisters in Christ to lift each other up, to share hardships and trials and troubles and heartaches. But also, God, to, to share the joy, show the high places. Just being in this presence lightens my day. To see people that love the Lord and truly love the Lord and try to do the very best they can. Father, thank you for them and what they mean in my life. Father, maybe I be an example for you. Help me to be strong to fight off Satan in my, in my walk. And Father, each of, that's true for everybody here. Because people look at us to see if we're different as Christians. And Father, we are different. We are different because of you and what you've done for us. Father, we ask you to be with our prayer request this week. Father, we know that you know each and every one. You're in the midst of each and every, every need, each and every desire. Father, help us to understand that your will will be done in every situation. Help us to look to you for the joy of our life. Rest in that. Have peace in that. One day soon, we'll be at peace with you in heaven. Thank you, Lord, for saving us. Send us grace through your Son. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. See you next week.